Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, the premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 177 of our Pharmacotherapy MCQ series which majors in infectious diseases. And the first question reads, LMM a four-year-old girl is admitted to the general pediatric ward of the hospital with suspected community-acquired pneumonia, CAP. She has no significant past medical history. She has no antibiotic exposure, and she has not received any vaccines. The penicillin MIC-50 and MIC-90 for Streptococcus pneumoniae isolates at your hospital are 2 mg per litre and 4 mg per litre, respectively. So my question to you is, which of the following would be the most appropriate empiric antibiotic agent to use for LMM's suspected CAP? Would it be A. Vancomycin, or B. Penicillin G, or C, ceftriaxone, or would it be D, ampicillin? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, C, ceftriaxone. This patient has not been immunized against Haemophilus influenza type B or Streptococcus pneumoniae, the most common bacterial pathogens in unvaccinated children with CAP. Ampicillin does not provide coverage for penicillin-resistant Streptococcus pneumoniae. Ceftriaxone provides coverage against Haemophilus influenza and Streptococcus pneumoniae, the most common bacterial pathogens in unvaccinated children with CAP. Ceftriaxone also provides coverage for penicillin-resistant Streptococcus pneumoniae, which represents a large proportion at least 10 of local isolates. The current Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, abbreviated as CLSI Susceptibility Breakpoint for Intravenous Penicillin against Streptococcus pneumoniae is equal to or less than 2 mg per litre. Because the MIC-90, that is the 90th percentile of isolates tested, is 4 mg per litre, at least 10% of the isolates tested have an MIC of 4 mg per litre or greater and therefore are resistant to penicillin. Penicillin G does not provide coverage for Haemophilus influenza or penicillin-resistant Streptococcus pneumoniae. Vancomycin does not provide coverage for Haemophilus influenza. Furthermore, use of vancomycin to provide coverage for methicillin-resistant Streptococcus aureus is not necessary because this patient is not exhibiting any readily apparent features consistent with Streptococcus aureus pneumonia, which include necrotizing or cavitary findings on imaging, or failure of previous antibiotic therapy. Please advance to the next question. And the next question reads, JMW, a 47-year-old man was diagnosed with HIV infection five years ago during a routine physical exam. He was asymptomatic then. He missed several past scheduled clinic appointments. 
he presents today for follow-up. Ready to start HAART, he has a past medical history significant for HIV infection diagnosed five years ago, hypertension, dyslipidemia, depression, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. With regard to his social history he uses no tobacco, he takes one to two drinks of alcohol per week. He is full-time employed and he works a eight to six job. With regard to his sexual history, he has been active with two to three partners in the last year, and always uses condoms. His current medications, all of which are oral, include, hydrochlorothiazide 25 mg once daily in the morning, atorvastatin 10 mg at night, sertraline 50 mg in the morning, metformin 500 mg twice daily after breakfast and dinner, antacids when necessary for occasional heartburn. He is allergic to sulfur drugs. His physical exam is unremarkable. Regarding the vascular system he has a blood pressure of 127 systolic, and 84 diastolic, and a heart rate of 68 beats per minute. He has a respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute, a body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, he weighs 75 kilograms, his height is 5 feet 9 inches. His pertinent labs include a serum creatinine of 0.8 mg per deciliter, AST 58, ALT 96, he has a CD4 count of 38 cells per millimeter cubed, an HIV RNA viral load of 195,000 copies per milliliter. His HIV resistance testing negative, toxoplasmosis IgG negative, G6PD. Deficiency negative, HLA-B star 5701 negative, HBSAG positive, anti-HBS negative, anti-HBCIGG positive, anti-HBCIGM negative, anti-HCV negative, HBV viral load of 150,000 international units per milliliter. So my question to you is, which of the following single tablet antiretroviral therapies would you recommend for the treatment of JMW's HIV infection? Would it be a. Realpivirine, Tenofovia alafenamide and Emtricetabin, marketed as Odif C, or b. Bictagraviar tenofovia alafenamide and emtricetabin, marketed as Bictavi, or, C, afavirins, tenofovia disoproxyl fumarate, and emtricetabin, marketed as A tripler, or would it be, D, dolutegraviar, abacaviar, and lamivudine, marketed as Traumec. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, B. Bictagraviar tenofovir alafenamide, emtricetabine marketed as Bictavi. Answer D is a single tablet regimen that is recommended as a first-line treatment option in the DHHS HIV treatment guidelines. The HLAB star 5701 test is negative, making abacaviar a potential therapeutic option. However, this patient also has hepatitis B virus infection for which lamivudine is suboptimal. A tenofovir containing HIV treatment regimen is preferred. Answer C is no longer recommended as first-line treatment in the DHHS treatment guidelines. In addition, this patient has a history of depression, making this HIV treatment regimen suboptimal given the link between efavirins and suicidal ideation. Answer B is recommended as a first-line treatment option in the DHHS HIV treatment guidelines. The regimen contains tenofovir alafenamide, which is a recommended treatment option in combination with emtricetabine for the treatment of this patient's hepatitis B virus infection. TAF may be preferred to TDF for long-term renal and bone health. 
There are some drug-drug interaction concerns that require patient counseling, e.g., the need to take doses at least two hours apart from antacid doses, but these are contraindications to the use of this HIV treatment regimen. Answer A is not recommended as a first-line treatment option in the DHHS treatment guidelines. Compared with other first-line options, it is associated with a higher rate of virologic failure in patients with a baseline viral load greater than 100,000 copies per milliliter. This patient's viral load is 195,000 copies per milliliter. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, considering the above clinical scenario, apart from initiating HAART, which of the following antimicrobial prophylaxis regimens for opportunistic infection would you recommend? Would it be a Coprimoxazole DS1 tablet once daily plus carifromycin 500 mg twice daily, or b Fluconazole 100 mg once daily plus cotrimoxazole DS1 tablet once daily, or, C. Dapsone 100 mg once daily plus azithromycin 1200 mg once weekly, or, would it be, D. Dapsone 50 mg once daily, pyrimethamine stroke leucovorin 50 mg stroke 25 mg weekly, plus azithromycin 1200 mg once weekly weekly. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, C, Dapsone 100 mg once daily plus azithromycin 1200 mg once weekly. Pyrimethamine and leucovorin used in combination with Dapsone will provide adequate toxoplasmosis prophylaxis in patients at risk of infection who are also sulfur allergic. However, this patient's toxoplasmosis IgG is negative indicating that he has never been exposed, so he does not require prophylaxis. Answer B is inappropriate since fluconazole is not recommended for oropharyngeal candidiasis prophylaxis. The patient is sulfur allergic, so cotrimoxazole is not an appropriate choice for pneumocystis prophylaxis. The patient's CD4 cell count is 38 cells per millimeter cubed, placing him at risk for several opportunistic infections, including oropharyngeal candidiasis, pneumocystis pneumonia, toxoplasmosis, and disseminated mycobacterium avium. According to the CDC, NIH, HIVMA recommendations, prophylaxis with fluconazole is not routinely recommended for oropharyngeal candidiasis. Pneumocystis requires prophylaxis when the CD4 cell count drops below 200 cells per millimeter cubed. The drug of choice is trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, but this patient is sulfur allergic and may receive dapsone instead because his G6PD deficiency test is negative. Since his CD4 cell count is also below 100 cells per millimeter cubed, the patient could be at risk for toxoplasmosis, but according to antibody testing, he has never been exposed and so he does not require prophylaxis. Lastly, because the patient's CD4 cell count is below 50 cells per millimeter cubed, he will require prophylaxis for mycobacterium avium. Azithromycin 1200 mg once weekly or clarithromycin 500 mg twice daily is recommended. The patient is sulfur allergic, so cotrimoxazole is not an appropriate choice for pneumocystis prophylaxis. Please progress to the next question.
and the next question reads, aka, a 45-year-old male patient whose height is t56 inches, and weight is 85 kilograms with HIV infection recently initiated HAART with a regimen consisting of LVTGRAVIAR boosted with COBE-C-STAT, tenofovir alafenamide, and emtricetabine, marketed as Genvoir. After 28 days of HAART, his HIV viral load drops to 12,000 copies per milliliter, from a baseline of 150,000 copies per milliliter. His four-week lab tests show that his serum creatinine increased to 1.2 mg per deciliter, from a baseline value of 1.0 mg per deciliter. A repeat serum creatinine two weeks later is also 1.2 mg per deciliter. His urinalysis is negative. So my question to you is, which one of the following recommendations would you make for AKA's HAART now? Would it be, A. Continue the HAART regimen and reassess the viral load for suppression 14 days from now, or, B. Change the HAART regimen due to virologic failure and reassess the viral load for suppression 28 days from now, or, C. Change the HAART regimen due to tenophobia associated nephrotoxicity and reassess the renal function two weeks from now, or would it be, D. Adjust the dose of HAART based on renal insufficiency and reassess the renal function 14 days from now. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, A. Continue the HAART regimen and reassess the viral load for suppression 14 days from now. This patient is not experiencing renal insufficiency. The rise in serum creatinine is caused only by the inhibition of active creatinine secretion in the proximal tubule by Kobe C stat. A change to this patient's ART regimen would be needed because of renal insufficiency only if his estimated glomerular filtration rate EGFR was below 30 ml per minute, but the EGFR in this patient is approximately 96 ml per minute, based on his age, sex, weight, and serum creatinine using the cockcroft gault formula. If dose adjustment was needed because of renal insufficiency, a different single tablet combination product would be required because LV Tegraviar is available only co formulated with Kobe C stat, tenophobia alafenamide, and M tree C to be marketed as Genvoir, or Kobe C stat, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, and M tree C to be marketed as Strabid. This patient is not experiencing tenofovir-associated nephrotoxicity. Although nephrotoxicity can result from the use of tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, it has not been associated with tenofovir alafenamide in clinical trials. This patient is taking tenofovir alafenamide. Patients with tenofovir-associated nephrotoxicity often present with evidence of proximal tubule injury, i.e., a positive urinalysis with glucosuria and proteinuria. This patient has a negative urinalysis. This patient is not experiencing virologic failure. He has had a more than tenfold decrease in his HIV viral load after four weeks of ART, which is the expected response to ART. A small, 10 to 20 percent, increase in serum creatinine is often seen after initiation of Kobe C stat containing ART regimens because Kobe C stat inhibits active creatinine secretion in the proximal tubule. This increase occurs within two weeks after starting the agent, and the SCR reaches a plateau. A negative urinalysis can be helpful in confirming the lack of kidney injury. This patient's viral load is responding appropriately to ART, decreasing more than tenfold within four weeks after starting ART. Therefore, there is no reason to think this ART regimen is failing at this time.
continuing ART and rechecking the viral load two weeks from now are appropriate for this patient. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, BJB, a 36-year-old male patient who presents to your comprehensive care HIV clinic to review the results of his HIV testing. He is currently asymptomatic. He currently takes no medications but seven days ago he recovered from a cold with fevers and gastrointestinal upset. He is tested routinely for HIV and last received a negative result with a HIV A, G, A, B, test 90 days ago. He is sexually active with one male partner who recently tested positive for HIV infection and is not yet on HAART. They frequently have unprotected sexual intercourse. He was tested last week by his primary care doctor. His results are as follows HIV A, G, A, B, test is positive, his HIV 1 or HIV 2 differentiation assay is negative. So my question to you is, which of the following best represents your assessment of BJB's HIV status? Is it, A, BJB could have chronic HIV infection and should receive an HIV Western blot test to confirm the diagnosis, or, B, BJB has chronic HIV infection and should be initiated on antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible, or, C, BJB does not have HIV infection, but he should receive counseling on risk reduction strategies and be retested three months from now, or, is it, D, BJB could have acute HIV infection and should receive an HIV viral load test to confirm the diagnosis? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, D, BJB could have acute HIV infection and should receive an HIV viral load test to confirm the diagnosis. BJB is at high risk of HIV infection because he is sexually active with a known HIV positive partner who is not on ART and they are not consistently using protection. His HIV A, G, A, B, test is positive, but his HIV 1, HIV 2 differentiation test is negative. These results in conjunction with BJB's recent flu-like illness are highly suspect and suggest the presence of acute HIV infection. The HIV A, G, A, B, test can be positive shortly after HIV exposure and prior to the development of antibodies because it detects the HIV P24 antigen. The follow-up HIV-1, HIV-2 differentiation assay can be negative during acute or early infection because it detects antibodies to HIV, which may not have formed yet following HIV exposure. According to the CDC HIV testing guidelines, BJB should undergo an HIV viral load test to determine whether he has acute or early infection. BJB may have HIV infection given his positive G A B test. He should receive additional testing now, not three months from now, with an HIV viral load to confirm his HIV status. It is unclear whether BJB has HIV infection. If he does, he probably is in the acute phase of infection given the discordance between his AG, AB, test and HIV-1, HIV-2 differentiation assay. If he does have HIV infection, he should receive antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible. A Western blot test will not be helpful in confirming a diagnosis of HIV in BJB. The test detects antibodies to HIV, which probably have not yet formed if BJB is in the early or acute phase of infection.
So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 178.